old. I can't remember. That's, that's, that's a long time ago. I can't even remember that long. Oh, yes, I was in Bible college just surviving. I was, <laughs> I was surviving. But why don't you come over here? So uh, you, you have a, a passion for missions. Yes, sir. And you said something profound to me, and you thought I didn't listen to you, but I did. Did you tell me that you believe that churches grow when we get a vision or a burden for missions? Is that what you said? Yes. Can you talk to me about that? Can you let us know what that means and just give us a bit of a, a synopsis of what you're doing? Because I, I believe great things are in store for you. I really do. Why don't you just share with us what's going on? Uh, amen. Uh, but really briefly, um, as a pastor said, I've been called to missions. But um, I do believe that our God is a missions God. Uh, as we read in Matthew, the Lord sends out a great commission. And it's uh, to go make disciples of all the earth. And it's to go preach the gospel. And I believe that it's not only to be shut up to ourselves, but it's to be given to every language, every tribe, every nation, every tongue. And I believe that God is a missions God because I just know that I know this is a very international church and I've seen a lot of um, different people from different backgrounds. But I know the Lord's a missions God because I come from a, a church for missions and I've had the privilege to go to uh, places in Latin America, uh, Europe, and uh, hopefully in a couple months to India and uh there's something extraordinary about what the Lord does on the missions field. And um, the Lord called me to a place not too long ago in Europe. And he came to me in a dream. And uh, I never had a dream from the Lord before. And he came to me. And I've never felt the presence of God so strongly in my life. And uh, I was praying and I was fasting for the Lord to send me somewhere. And I know God is a missions God. Because if he would say... I want you to go to Europe. I want you to go to this country thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away just for one person. One person got saved. One person, uh, and there was many people saved on that trip, but for one person, if God would come to me in a dream, if he would take his time, his visitation, and everything he has for one person across the world, and little old me in a small town, God cares about people so, so much. Our God is a missions God. It's not to sit at a pew at church, but it's to walk out the gospel. And the gospel is not meant to be in the compounds of the wall, but outside the church. The missions field is not in some other country, but the missions field is in your community. The missions field is at your job. The missions field is at your local grocery store. When you walk up this church, this is your missions field. Some people may never hear the gospel from anywhere else, but they will hear it from you. And one day when we stand before the Lord, I believe we begin to see the harvest that we sowed. When the, when the Lord reaps his harvest, we'll begin to see the fruit one day. That all the seeds that we have sown and all the blessings that God has done in our life. And these services weren't just for meant to be in the confines of this church. But they're meant for other people. Every day when we walk outside. It's for others. We're meant to be poured into so we can be poured out our God is a missions God and I know he loves people very very much and um, I just believe that tonight in this revival I believe people are always called to nations during revival so if there's a call of missions or evangelism on your heart or you have a burden for people or you're asking for a burden for people tonight you'll get it or tomorrow you'll get it but during revival God always sends people out he always does. For the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. He is a God that longs for people to pick up and go, pick up the word, and go to places that have never been reached. If he's calling you, don't run from the call. I've heard a quote one time, and I'll give it back to the pastor. A missionary said this. He said, if God called you to be a missionary, don't stoop to be a king. For the greatest calling and the greatest thing you could ever do is to take the word of God to a place and to a people who have never heard it. Because the greatest blessing you can receive is Jesus. So God bless you guys. Man. There's some preacher here going with us. What a, what a joy. What a privilege. And I say that privilege to have him. I, I've been saying this every night and I will continue to say it until you leave. I honestly sincerely believe that Robert Martin is a voice to the nations. Simply a voice. A, a, a God's voice. And you can put whatever you want beside that. Evangelist. Revivalist. Whatever you want to put. You put it. 
but he is a voice to the nations. He's traveled over 30 different nations throughout the world. And God has used him in powerful, powerful measure. And we're just really excited and honored to have you with us again tonight, dear brother. Why don't we welcome and give him a great big God bless you. Praise the Lord. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming back, oh glorious day. <laughs> Casting crowns tried to slow it down. I don't know, maybe the songwriter who wrote it, wrote it slow, but it, he didn't mean it. He did, he, he did it on accident if he wrote it slow. But I like the way Donnie McClurkett sings it. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. Oh, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming back, oh glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain, one day they nailed him to die on a tree, suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. Living, he loved me, dying, he saved me, buried, he carried my sins far away, rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming back, oh glorious day, and one day the grave could conceal him no longer one day the stone rolled away from the door then he arose over death he has conquered now is ascended my lord forevermore oh living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away and rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming back oh glorious day and one day the trumpet will sound forth his coming one day the skies with his glory will shine wonderful day my beloved ones bringing glorious savior this jesus is mine oh living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away and rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming back oh glorious day how many believe that tonight hallelujah glory 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 hallelujah amen 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 hebrews chapter 12 and verse 26 praise the lord pastor ken you got a song request tonight Anything on your heart? All right. Praise the Lord. So honored to have him and Sister Joan here tonight. Good to have Dina and Daniela and Hannah and Austin here tonight. God bless you, my extended family. Am I adopted, Sister Dina? Can I be adopted? I mean, I'm putting you on the spot in front of everybody. You can't say no now. It's like a pr public proposal. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Good to have pastor's family here tonight. Amen. And their friends and those that have they brought with them. Thank you so much for being here. So good to have you here tonight. I thought, mercy, these, there was about the same crowd as we got started, as was here last night. The faithful say, snow or no snow, we're coming anyways. Praise the Lord. I thank God for a revival church. We're hungry for the Lord. We're hungry for the Lord to do something so much greater than a service. Hallelujah. God, have your way tonight. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 26. Would you mind standing to your feet for the reading of God's word tonight? Thank you, Brother Dalton, for exhorting about missions. You can tell there's a lot in his heart, can't you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I honor that man of God. He's 22 years old. But he loves the Lord. He loves the presence of the Lord. He loves prayer. He loves seeking the Lord. He loves meditating on the Lord. He loves talking about the Lord. And if he's not invited anywhere to preach, he's looking for somebody on the street. He's looking for somebody on the airplane. He's looking for somebody to talk to about Jesus. 
See, if you're called to missions, you don't, you don't have to wait to go to a foreign field. You can start now. Nothing magical happens when you get a visa and a passport. You don't turn into something else when the plane lands. You are there what you are here. And so whatever call you have, you can operate in it now. Amen. Thank God for him. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 26, the Bible said, Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. I'd like to preach with the help of the Lord tonight on being the epicenter of a move of God. Father, we ask you to do what only you can do. Your word is anointed all by itself. Lord, we ask now, let an anointing come upon us to communicate with unction, not something from a textbook, not something from a theology perspective, but something from your throne room. Let your voice command the attention of everyone under the sound of my voice, God, tonight. Lord, God, cause me, God, to hide behind the cross, but that Christ would be revealed. And give us an anointing to receive what the Spirit would say to the church. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. My first time preaching in Kenya several years ago was actually a Canadian uh, connection that the Lord opened up with Dr. Rosalind Oketch, a Kenyan who's a professor at uh, a university in Newfoundland. And she, she invited me after speaking with her bishop. And we went, my friend Robbie and I, we were there for four weeks. We preached in three different major cities and uh, preached about five times a day um, to, to hospitals and orphanages and Bible colleges and morning prayer meetings and noon prayer meetings and evening crusades. And at the end of those four weeks, they said, we'd like to offer you a trip to the Maasai Mara to uh, experience a true safari. It was a dream come true. And so we, we go like 12-hour drive uh, down bumpy roads until we get to the Maasai Mar, which is the northern Serengeti, uh, up, coming up out of Tanzania. And uh, we're seeing all these amazing animals. We're, we're seeing uh, giraffes and cheetahs and lions and, 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 and elephants and water buffalo. And it's, it's an amazing thing in hippopotamus. But they said, they said, you're here just a week before the wildebeest migration. They said in only a week, they said they're coming right now from the Serengeti in Tanzania. Africans say Tanzania. They're coming up they're on their way. You're just here just a few days early. I just, I, 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 could, you, could you help me? Because I missed it. I wasn't there for the wildebeest migration. But, but could we just, could you help me pretend tonight? Would you just close your eyes with me? And would you just, uh, would you just imagine the sun rising over the African savanna? Makes me want to sing a Lion King song right now, but that's not the Lord. That's just my carnal nature. And, and the smell as the grass is being blown by the wind, and then right over the horizon, not one, not a herd, but tens of thousands, hundreds of, as your eyes closed, come on, don't be disobedient tonight, and you're smelling the smell of wildebeests and thousands upon thousands, and then as your eyes are closed, can you just begin to slowly tap your feet on the ground and imagine the sound of Oh, can you hear it? Come on, your eyes are closed. You're thinking about, you're right here with me. You're in Africa. Tens of thousands. And then out of nowhere, here comes a lioness leading a hunt. And now the wildebeests are not just walking. Now they're stampeding. Beat your feet on the ground hard. Beat your feet on the ground hard. Faster, faster, faster. Here they come. Tens of thousands of wildebeests are charging out. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. I just saved your life. <laughs> Aren't you so thankful? You were not trampled. You're welcome. I imagine while I was there what it must have been like to have been in the midst of such a place when there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of hoofs 
trampling the earth at once, it must show up on some seismological reading that there is a tremor in the center, in the heart of, of East Africa because of that many footsteps shaking the ground. But if the Lord steps down, it doesn't take tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. It says, he who shook the earth shall shake it again. And he will shake everything that sh can be shaken so that only the unshakable remains. I don't have to have a great gift of prophecy to know that as you have been praying for revival and as the Lord has been drawing your heart to revival, there's been a shaking in your home. There's been a shaking in your life. He shakes off the distractions. He makes you discontent with things that are not eternal, that are only temporary and fleeting and do not last. And he begins to shake every idol, everything that is not eternal until your heart is fixed on him alone. Amen. People have said that they've tried to live the Christian life and found it to be too difficult and then gave up. But my answer to them would be this. Christianity is not hard. It's impossible. For Christianity is walking the steps of Christ. Living the life of Christ. And you cannot live the life of another man. I cannot crawl inside the heart, inside the chest, inside the skin of Pastor Kim Bombay. Nor can he crawl inside of me and live my life. I cannot live his life. And yet there is a way in which when you are born again and you will go down to the waters of baptism. It's the symbol that the old man Robert is now dead. But now I've been raised as we sang resurrection life tonight. Raised in newness of life. And now Christ lives in me he lives through me and that means when I'm taking footsteps in this earth if I'm walking in his will things are being shaken because of the authority of God's kingdom coming in the earth think about it over and over there's references how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel of good news Jesus, he puts one foot on the shore of the gatherings and here comes a demoniac with thousands of demons but cannot resist the footstep of Almighty God. Every stronghold comes down when Jesus steps into the vicinity. Nothing can resist him when he is moving in our midst. Over and over in scripture, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his glory filled the temple and the doorpost shook at the voice of them that cried holy 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 why because when God shows up there's a shaking and in Acts chapter 4 after Peter and John had, had, had prayed and, 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 and healed the lame man at the gate beautiful and then they were, they were beaten and they were commanded to no longer preach in the name of Jesus and they went back to a prayer meeting which was probably very likely the upper room where, where it may have been John Mark's house but the upper room where they often met together for prayer and those believers that were there they did not say Lord help us to not get beaten again. They did not say Lord help Christians to have an easy way of life they didn't say God give us promotions on our jobs and could we please have a Mercedes or a Cadillac or at least a Maserati they only prayed this God give us boldness that while they threaten us we will speak of the glory of the name of Jesus and while they prayed the Bible says the place was shaken see this is what drives us to revival because we've read the book and we've recognized that there are things available to us that we have not yet stepped into. My shadow is not yet healing the sick. My handkerchiefs are not yet raising the dead. Hallelujah. And I've not yet been in a prayer meeting where there was an earthquake. But when God shows up in Isaiah 6, in Acts chapter 4, even at the crucifixion, when he prayed and said, it is finished. And he gave up the ghost, the Bible said. There was an earth shake. God getting the world's attention something powerful is taking place God will allow a shaking when he's getting ready to do something and I, I know my grandfather he would not have developed messages like this but in my generation it seems that if you want to learn something you start typing it in Google and so I, I knew that there was a such thing as as tremors 
that happened before earthquakes. I live in Florida. We don't have earthquakes. We have hurricanes. I'm used to hurricanes. I'm so used to hurricanes that when hurricanes come, I'm standing outside with my redneck family just sitting in the lawn chair watching stuff blow by, watching people's roofs fly off. You know, everybody acting like you got to hunker down. 140 mile an hour winds. No, we just sit out there with our sweet iced tea and say, hey, there go. I think I recognize that cow. That guy belongs over to that guy over there. Not really, but kind of, sort of. You can get used to certain things. And, and then I went to Missouri for Bible college and, and the sirens would go off every once in a while. They would test the, the tornado sirens. And the first time I heard it, it made my liver quiver. But after a while, you hear it enough until you just say, oh, that's just the, the tornado siren going off. But then I went and I preached in Tonga in the South Pacific and there was a pastor in Kentucky he said are you going to Tonga I said yes he said I have an app on my phone and it vibrates every time there's an earthquake in the world with a 5.0 or greater on the Richter scale and he said there was an earthquake today in Tonga and he told me how strong it was and his phone was vibrating and I said good they got it out of the way and so I thought, I hope that the runway's still in existence. And I landed, and I asked the, I asked the missionaries. They said, yeah, we had a pretty big one yesterday, but, but we survived. It's all right. They said, we have them pretty often here. They put me in a brand new room that they built on their missions house. Now, if you've been in uh, some foreign countries where they don't have building codes, if it stands up, you can live in it. <laughs> and so this was a wood frame old, old missions house. I'm on the second floor in a new kind of wing. They just attached over, uh, I don't even know. And so I'm the first one to be in this room. And in the middle of the night, things start shaking. And I don't know about you. It's just shaking so much. My eyes went wide open. I said, Jesus, forgive me for all my sin, because I want to make sure I was ready for the rapture. <sighs> don't act like you're not <laughs> so sanctified. Come on. I was raised right. We believe you had to get it under the blood. You don't just pray once and then commit all the sin you want. You better stay under the blood. I remember being a boy, my mama be in traffic, slam on brakes. And when she slammed that brake, me and my sister both, Jesus, forgive me for all my sins because we want to be ready. It starts shaking, my bed's rattling. And I thought, oh, my goodness, Jesus, come back. Okay, what's going on? And then it stopped, and I fell back asleep. I woke up in the morning. I thought, was that a dream? Did that really happen? I asked, um, I asked Renee Carlson, the missionary's uh, the, the, the wife, and she said, um, she said, no, that was, a, that, was a, that was a big one last night. She said, you didn't hear me scream? I said, no, I didn't hear you scream, but why did you scream? You said they happen here all the time. She said, they do happen all the time. I scream every time. Because you may get used to earth, hurricanes and you may get used to tornadoes, but you cannot get used to that which is supposed to be solid turning into liquid and all of a sudden becoming immovable. And so it is that our lives are so established in what we think we know is right and what we want to establish and build it upon that God said, I want to get their attention. I'm going to send a shaking. So I begin to look up what happens before an earthquake and I typed in tremors before and sometimes Google will give you a suggestion of what maybe they think you're looking for and instead of putting tremors before earthquakes that the, the, the first thing that came up was tremors before sleep and I thought well that's interesting because probably everybody in this room has gone to take a little nap before and about 20 seconds to a minute and a half into that nap it's really bad if you're in high school and you're not meaning to fall asleep. You just accidentally fell into a nap. And all of a sudden, you feel like your leg fell off the bed. You feel like you're just falling in the midst of it. And you have one of those tremors right in the beginning of falling asleep. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so I started trying to research, what is that? And they said, they don't really know why that happens. But it's something that, that can, that can wake it, awaken you, or you can just turn it off and go back to sleep. And as I begin to pray that Lord putting this message in my heart about an epicenter, about God moving in a place, I said, Lord, what are you saying to us about the tremors? I felt like though the Lord was saying to me, I will send a shaking, I will send a tremor to wake my people up before there's a great shaking. I, I believe that if there will come, 
overcome apocalyptic kind of shaking in our economy, in our politics, in levels of persecution. If you're not aware, friend, it's not far from us. It's right on the horizon. Our, th- our, our world is so unstable. Our political situations are unstable. Naming the name of Jesus does not have the liberty that it used to have. Reading scripture about things the Bible says is sin is now illegal as hate speech in many places. And so before God sends a great shaking, he sends the tremor and those that have discernment can feel the tremor saying something is moving something is it's the tectonic plates that are pushing and pushing and pushing and before they slip before there's a shift and there's a great earthquake there'll be the tremors of the pressure have you sensed it in your spirit Do I have any discerners in the house that sense there's something on the horizon and God is trying to wake up his church, but if we hit the snooze alarm on the trimmers, we may not be prepared for the shaking. The next thing I saw that came up is said trimmers before death. And I begin to read about something that doctors also cannot explain, but they say sometimes just in the last hours before someone passes, Their body begins to have tremors and shakes. I don't want to be a part of the tremors that God tried to wake us up and get our attention. How many denominations once had revival, but now they're dead? How many churches? I traveled with a singing group from my Bible college, and when we would travel across the country... Sometimes the the choir director, who had been in that position for well over 30 years, his father, the founder of the Bible College, he said, you know, we used to sing at a church over in this community. We'd be passing through on the bus. We used to sing at a church in this city. I heard him say it a handful of times while we traveled. We used to sing at a great, great, mighty church over here. And I said, what's that church doing now? He said, it's closed. Used to be a, a revival church. Brother Robert, we used to sing, and it was like liquid fire was coming out of the ceiling. People shouting in the aisles, people running, people running to the altar and getting saved. God, move it. What happened? They died. They were not heeding the shaking of the Lord in their spirit. From the tremor before death was not heeded, and they were not ready for the shaking. I believe it is the will of God. For a shaking of revival to change everything. One of my favorite quotes of revival is two boys in Wales in 1905 coming home from school. And because such, such change and transition had happened in Wales, in the United Kingdom, in a short period of time, these two boys were talking to each other. And one said to the other, what's, what's happened here? What's going on? He was insinuating by his question that our teachers are different. Our parents are different. The, shops, the shop owners are different. You know, they said that the miners that used to curse at their mules because they got saved during that revival and they stop cursing because if you get saved your tongue gets saved too come on in here amen they stop cursing and that the mules no longer knew whether they were supposed to gee or ha because it usually came with a command attached to a curse word see everything was changing they said farmers would be out in the field plowing and the power of God would come on them and they begin to shout and stagger in the spirit only to realize later in harvest season why some of the rows weren't straight was because in plowing season the power of God had touched down right there where the plow was the God everything's that one boy asked another what's what's going on here everything's different and then his schoolmate said back to him he said don't you know Jesus lives here now Some people just want a good church that will bring an incremental change by serving the community and smiling as greeters and passing out bulletins and serving some meals at Thanksgiving to the less fortunate and loving on the community. And that's a wonderful representation of the love of Jesus. But there is more than that. If you read the Bible, you see that when the apostles showed up, it said, these men have turned the world upside down. That when you are a carrier of Christ, then you have been possessed of him. You're not a Christian trying to live for him you have Christ in you living through you you're taking God's steps and when you're taking God's steps things cannot remain normal there comes a shaking let me read you a little bit about a shaking that took place in California April 18th 1906 at 5 15 a.m. the quake awoke G.A. Raymond as he slept in his room at the Palace Hotel he was a journalist He described his escape, one of the worst natural disasters to ever hit America. 
He said, I awoke as I was thrown out of bed, attempting to walk. The floor shook so that I fell. I grabbed my clothing and rushed down into the office where dozens were already congregated. Suddenly, the lights went off. Everyone rushed to the door. Survivors huddled in a plaza. Outside, I witnessed a sight I never want to see again. It was dawn and light. I looked up. The air was filled with falling stones. People around me were crushed to death on all sides. All around the huge buildings were shaking and waving. Every moment there was reports like a hundred cannons going off at one time. Then streams of fire would shoot out and other reports followed. I asked a man standing next to me what happened. Before he could answer, a thousand bricks fell on him and he was killed. A woman threw her arms around my neck. I pushed her away and fled. All around me buildings were rocking and flames shooting. As I ran, people on all sides were crying, praying, calling for help. I thought the end of the world had come. I met a Catholic priest and he said we must get to the ferry. He knew the way and we rushed down Market Street. Men and women, children were crawling from the debris. Hundreds were rushing down the street. Every minute people were felled by debris. At places the streets were cracked open. Chasms extended in all directions. I saw a drove of cattle wild with fright rushing up Market Street. I crouched beside a swaying building. As they came nearer they disappeared, seeming to drop out into the earth. When the last had gone, I went near and found they had indeed been precipitated into the earth, a wide fissure having swallowed them. I was crazy with fear and the horrible sights. How I reached the ferry, I cannot say. It was bedlam, pandemonium, and hell rolled into one. There must have been 10,000 people trying to get on that boat. Men and women fought like wildcats to push their way aboard. Clothes were torn from their backs. Men and women and children indiscriminately. Women fainted, and there was no water at hand with which to revive them. Men lost their reason. At those awful moments, one big strong man beat his head against one of the iron pillars on the dock and cried out in a loud voice, this fire must be put out. The city must be saved. It was awful. He said, I climbed on the boat. I turned around. At once was a city full of skyscrapers, a beautiful skyline, San Francisco. He said, but now in just a moment, it was rubble and it was under flames. What are you saying, Robert? I'm telling you that all it takes is not 25 years of slow discipling one at a time praying God help us to be nice Christians in our community let's play patty cake with everybody that's on their way to hell but instead if we believe in a God of revival then we can say God make this place the epicenter of a move of God isn't he doing it all over the world hasn't he done it in Argentina isn't he doing it in Africa amen Iran is now the fastest growing Christian country in the world the mosques are empty and the Christians are increasing without number. Hallelujah. Isn't he doing it in China? China is about to have more Christians numerically, even though they're the minority because the population of China is so great. They're about to have more Christians numerically than any other any other country in the world God is pouring out his spirit I preached in a Presbyterian church in Pakistan they prayed in tongues they prophesied they cast out devils they laid hands on the sick if he's doing it in Pakistan if he's doing it in Argentina if he's doing it in Iran if he's doing it in Africa if he's doing it in China oh God we want you to do it here When a great earthquake takes place out at sea, they warn countries even thousands of miles away, be prepared for riptide, be prepared for tidal waves, be prepared for waves that will crest much higher than normal. I don't know about you, but I refuse to live in the ripple effects of a revival of another continent. I feel like I could stop there and go home and you've heard my heart that burns for God to move. I said, I don't know about you, but I refuse to be satisfied with the ripple effects of a move of God in another part of the world. England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, once the greatest missions force in our world. Now their churches are being turned into condominiums and apartment buildings. And do you know where... Do you know who is pastoring the largest spirit-filled powerhouse churches in England? Africans. 
When it used to be the David Livingstons and the Robert Moffats that were sent out from Scotland and that were charting and mapping Central Africa. Now it is Africa that has taken hold of the gospel and has become missionaries to darken corners of Europe. Will that become our heritage? Will that become our reality? That we have to call South Korea to the largest church in the world and ask them to send them from Yoweda Full Gospel Church where they have prayer mountain, where they have 4 a.m. prayer meeting every day of the week and say, you love Jesus enough, would you get a fire to bring it back to us? Oh, God, have mercy. Let us have enough tremor in our spirit to say, Lord, make our footsteps the epicenter of a move of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 37 and 23 says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. When I was Dalton's age, I had never been to Canada. I did not know much about the geography of Canada. And I had no idea that the Lord had footprints with my name on it marked out from Mississauga. I never knew when I was 22 years old, the Lord would cause my steps to be ordered into this great church that is hungry for revival. But the Bible says that the steps of a good man or woman are ordered of the Lord. I've never been to dance class, but I can imagine that there's places where they say, if you're going to learn this dance, you're going to learn this waltz, you've got you've to put your foot in the steps. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And if you will walk in the steps that have been ordered, then you will be able to complete the moves of the dance. Friend, I've never been in such a dance class and have no desire to, but I can tell you this. I may not know your name, but God has written your name on footsteps and he has ordered them. How are we going to have such a move of God, Brother Robert? How are we going to have such a shaking that changes our family, that changes our struggles, that brings victory, that causes causes healing to break out, that causes strongholds to come down. How are we going to experience such a world, earth-shaking move of God? I can tell you how. Step in obedience to the will of God. When you, y'all forgot, y'all forgot, y'all forgot. Golf claps don't help me preach, not at all. Y'all looking at me like, that was a good thought. We might think about that and talk about it later. After service, we go to McDonald's. We'll just have a little hamburger and talk about what he said. Lord, have mercy. Oh, do you not feel it burning in your spirit? Amen. To walk in the ordained steps of God is to take God's steps. And he doesn't need a hundred thousand wildebeest hoofs. He needs one man or woman of God to walk out of this church and into their living room and say, I'm putting down a foot of obedience. It's God's will that I be in this house. It's God's will that his kingdom come and his will be done. Oh, hallelujah. I'm not done preaching, but why don't you just stand up real quick? Come on, all over this room, stand up. Hallelujah. Woo. I'm enjoying my preaching whether you are or not. I feel faith in this place. I want you to do something for me. You're not wildebeest now. You're men and women of God. You're children of the Most High God. Why don't you just put your foot up and down just once or twice? Come on, just stomp real quick. You know what that sound is? Listen and look at me right now. Look, 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 look. You are standing in the perfect will of God on Tuesday night in Mississauga, Ontario. How many times have you tried to pray and the devil said, you can't get a prayer through, you've not obeyed enough? How many times have you tried to worship and the devil said, you can't get a hallelujah through, you're too disobedient, you're too carnal, you're not walking in the spirit, the devil is a liar. Right now I'm standing in the, oh, right now I'm in the will of God. I'm in the will of God in this revival service. Woo. Mm. Come on, obey God. When you take steps of obedience, hallelujah. Well, if you ain't going to run the aisle, sit down. Amen. When you take steps of obedience, the kingdom of God comes. 
The devil could send every demon of fear into the heart of Moses from the burning bush to Pharaoh's court and say, don't go, don't go. You're going to get killed. They're going to remember when you murdered an Egyptian. They're going to bring up your past. Your cousin Hebrews are going to laugh at you. They're going to say you abandoned him. He could have every voice screaming at him. It don't matter. It don't matter how he feels. He might feel depressed. He might feel anxiety. It don't matter. Just keep picking up your feet and putting them down, Moses. As long as you keep walking in the will of God, deliverance shall come. When you step in obedience, when you step in obedience, I don't know, y'all may think that song, I don't, I don't know what your theology is about reckless love, but the bridge of that song, no shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up, coming after me, no wall you won't kick down, no lie you won't tear down. Every time I sing it, I see the footprint of God up, listen, I'm not saying it happened this way. You're just in my imagination of faith. I see the footprint of God kicking down the stone out of my graveyard. The stone wasn't hindering him. It wasn't his grave to begin with. It was my grave. Hallelujah. Amen. But when he crawled up off that slab that he was laying on for three days and he put his foot on the ground the party of the devil was now over because he was walking in resurrection ah uh, maybe he didn't kick it down but I see in prayer I see in prayer I see in prayer the stronghold that hold me back Jesus put your foot on it Woo. Jesus, kick down the end of my grave. Kick out the end of my coffin and I can come out of here. Isn't that what happened for Peter? Peter was asleep in jail. Amen. Four quaternions of soldiers. That means 16 of them. And the angel, the angel smote him and said, get on your clothes. We're getting out of here. He was delirious. He didn't know if it was a dream or a vision. He came to one gate. He came to another gate. But when he came to the main gate, the Bible said it opened of its own accord you know why because when you one two three four oh the lord put my name on that step the lord ordered my step into this marriage the lord ordered my step into this church the lord ordered my step into this revival service hallelujah all of a sudden prison doors start opening you know why i pull for people to come to an altar because i feel the holy ghost calling them to take steps and i've seen people set free from their seat to the people to the altar before they even start praying. Why? Because they're walking in the calling and the will of God. Help me, Brother Josh. Come on, somebody praise him tonight. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you a Bible story and then we're going to pray. Oh, whose is this? Hallelujah. God knows what you're going through, but he still ordered your steps to be here tonight. You didn't get here early because you probably had a struggle to get here because the devil wanted you to turn around and go back home, but you didn't. You're standing in the will of God. Hallelujah. Joey, I don't know you, but, but God knows you. He knows your last name. He knows your middle name. He's got steps. Joey, oh Joey, how old are you? I had no idea when I was 14 that God would send me to stand on platforms in Papua New Guinea and Tonga and Vanuatu and the Central American, South American, Turkey and invitations to Afghanistan. I didn't know but the steps were already there on the map of my life. If I didn't walk in those steps, I can tell you right now, Joey, I'd be backslid and on my way to hell because the only safe place to be, I'm telling you, it is safer to be in Afghanistan in the will of God than sitting in your recliner at home. He's got footprints with your name on it. He's got footprints ordered 
with your name on it. He ordered your steps to be here tonight, sis. Tabitha, Tiffany, I got T.I. Hallelujah. He's ordered your steps to be here. Every single one of you, you're right on time. How hungry for God must you be to drive an hour and a half from Brantford? Lose sleep. Still have to get up and go to work. I just want to be in the will of God. Because I know if I can take steps that are ordered in His will. God, He's got steps for you too. He's got steps for you too, brother. Every single person in this place, no matter how young, no matter how old, if you walk in the will of God, there's a shaking in hell. Just like Jesus called, crawled off of that slab where his body was laid in the tomb, when his feet hit the ground, resurrection power surged and the party in hell was over. He was alive again. You ought to know when you get out of bed in the morning, the devil is scared to death for you to put your feet on the ground. He's trying to get you depressed before you stand up. He's trying to get you dreading the day before you get out of bed. He's trying to get you to wake you up with a negative phone call. He's trying to get you to have every kind of evil thought because he knows when you put your feet on the ground, the same resurrection power. Oh, hallelujah. Mm. The first mention of the gospel in the Bible is Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. It's called the Proto-Evangelium. I'm intimidated by this doctor of theology over here. He knows way more than I do, but he can, he can set it straight if I mess it up. It's the first mention of the gospel in the Bible, and it says this. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and you shall bruise his heel, but he shall crush your head. When he rose from the grave, he crushed the head of the serpent but then he tells us I give you power to tread on serpents he didn't say dance with him he didn't say play with him he didn't say have church with him he didn't say kiss him and sing with him he said you can walk on him hallelujah why he said I already crushed the head of him he said it felt so good to crush the head of the devil come over here come on you can do it too you want to walk on the head of the devil I give you power to have a serpent head crushing anointing Real quick, real quick, real quick. Just stomp your feet on the ground. Just real quick, real quick, real quick. You hear that sound? You hear that sound? Now listen to me. You know what that's a sound of? That's a sound of worship. Because he says, I seek those that will worship in spirit and in truth. Truth means that what I have said with my lips, I'm walking out with my life. See, you don't have to go in your house and scream in tongues if your spouse isn't serving the Lord. Just walk in. You don't even have to stomp your foot. You can walk softly, but in the spirit, the giant knows his head is about to be chopped off because you're walking in obedience to the will of God. Revival comes through obedience. I don't want to be near the will of God. I don't want to be in the ripple effects of somebody else that obeyed God. Lord, I long to live in the epicenter of a move of God. I see his footprint on the back of your gravestone and he's kicked it down for you so that you can walk out and kick down some strongholds for somebody else. I'm done. I just want to tell you this Bible story and then we're going to pray. 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 24 and it came to pass after this that Ben Hadad the king of Syria gathered all his host and went up and listen the Bible said they besieged Samaria now if you've only watched war movies you think that when the Bible said that they were at war that they lined up against the front gate of a city that's not what they did they besieged it that means they completely surrounded a city they did not let any supplies come in or out and they would let a city starve to death so that they didn't even have to fight. And it said that Samaria was besieged by Syria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver and the fourth, fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. Now imagine this, if 
you can, that you're going into a public market, an open air market, as is all over the world, a farmer's market, if you will, and they've run out of food. They've run out of commodities. They've run out of everything. The only thing left to eat is now the head of the donkey and the leftover manure of the dove. Somebody has to go tell the king. Someone has to advise the king we've run out. Nobody wants that job. Nobody wants to be the bearer of bad news, but somebody has to tell the king, we have no more wheat, we have no more barley, we have no more oil, we've run out. I would love to be the preacher that gets to travel the world and say, hey, we're living in the greatest move of God. Oh man, every time we get together, it's just the best thing that's ever happened. We're winning, we're winning, we're winning. There's nobody left to be saved. Everybody's on their way to heaven and the church is more powerful than it's ever been. But can I tell you, it's not an easy job, but if you're going to obey God, here's the truth of the matter. We've run out of some things in the kingdom of God. We've run out of conviction. Conviction. When I was a boy, my granddaddy preached and didn't have to give altar calls because I remember people running to the altar in the middle of the sermon, gripped by conviction. Holding on to the back of the pews until their knuckles were turning white because they were gripping it so hard under conviction. And if they didn't come to the altar, they laid in bed that night awake as the Spirit of God chased them down and dealt with them about their soul. Conviction. Friend, can I tell you, we have great productions but we have run out of conviction. We've run out of some things. We're running low on character. We're running, running low on integrity. Most places, we've run out of prayer warriors. We're not even tuned into reality. We've run out of a burden for prayer. A burden for the lost. Come on, I'm scraping the bottom of the bucket in the marketplace of the church and saying, is there any burden left for the nations? Is there any burden left for your neighbors that are going to a Buddhist temple and a Hindu temple and a mosque or nowhere at all? Have you, are you burdened at all? We've run out. We've run out of the bidding of the Spirit and an obedience to His voice. We've run out of healing and we've run out of revival. And Amos said in the last days there'll come a famine not of bread for hunger or water for thirst but a famine of the hearing of the word of God. There's some stuff we've run out of. I think it's very specific that the Bible said the one thing that was being sold was the dung of a dove. Because a dove throughout scripture is a symbol of the Holy Spirit and many places have the remembrance of when the dove was in the house. But when the dove leaves all there is is the mark of of that he used to be here. I don't know about you. I don't want to learn recipes on how to survive on what used to be. I don't want to figure out how to survive on the Holy Ghost used to flap its wings in this house. Somebody had to pray and somebody had to hear from God. And so it says in the next chapter, chapter 7 and verse 1, then Elisha, somebody say Elisha, said hear ye the word of the lord anybody come tonight for a word from heaven thus saith the lord tomorrow somebody say tomorrow come on he didn't say 12 months he didn't say 12 years everything doesn't have to happen gradually something can some things happen instantly and supernaturally that's what we believe revival is somebody say amen tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. You know what he was saying? He was saying the market is about to change. There's about to be an ab abundance of food until even the poor people can afford it. We're about to be overloaded with provision. Then an advisor on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? You know what happens when you start talking about revival? Naysayers, critics, cynical people, negative people say, oh, that's not real. That can't really happen. That's not for today. The devil is a liar. Amen. He said, Could, if there were windows, in, let me tell you something, friend. There are windows in heaven. 
He said in Malachi, see that I won't open up for you the windows of heaven. And so Elisha said, behold, he told the advisor who was critical, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat thereof. He said, you're going to watch this thing come to pass, but you won't partake of it. He said, and there were four lepers. This is what I find amazing. The word of the Lord went out. Everything's about to change in this city. Everything's about to change in your houses. Everything's about to change in your lives. Everything's about to change. Everything's about to change. Oh, could you even receive a word like that? That God could do something and everything might change in Canada. Everything might change in North America. Everything might change. Do you know slavery used to be illegal in the United States? It's not legal anymore. You know why? Secular textbooks won't tell you this, but there were prayer meetings during the early 18 and mid 1800s in the holiness revival of 10 and 20,000 people. And one of their main prayer requests was for the abolition of slavery. Can I tell you, my nation changed because revival happened in prayer meetings. And if it happened before, it can happen again until abortion is abolished. Everything can change. He said, tomorrow about this time, everything's going to change. I can imagine the warriors starting to shine their shields, starting to sharpen their swords, generals starting to put together battle strategies. Amen. The army starting to talk to one another. Who's going to go defeat the Syrians? Who's going to be the one that when they bring in the spoils of war and everything changes, they'll hoist us on their shoulders and they'll say, you are our champions. But you know who didn't hear the word? It said four lepers outside the city. There were four lepers men entering into the gate and they said one to another, why sit we here till we die? They were outcasts. They weren't even allowed in the city. They said, if we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. And if they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the king of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians, and they've come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And the Bible said these lepers begin to go through the camp and begin to get gold and food and provision until they said, this isn't right. We can't keep this for ourselves. And they went into the city and they said, the enemy has fled and they have left us all the spoils of war at our doorstep. And people ran out to get the abundance. And as they were running back into the city, they were selling fine flour for a shekel and barley for a shekel. And the advisor of the king went out to see it. And when he went out, he saw it. And then he was trampled down and died and did not partake of it. What are you saying, Brother Robert? I'm saying you don't have to be a charter member at this church. You don't have to have a degree in theology. You don't have to have the finest sword or shield. You can be someone who is so beat down like a leper. But when the word of the Lord goes forth and says everything's about to change, if someone will walk in the word, when the prophet said it's about to change like a sidewalk, a plank went out. See, you can't walk in impossible things, but you can walk on the word. I preached too long. I've done wore you out. Are you still with me tonight? Peter saw Jesus walking on the water. He said, if that's you, bid me that I could come unto you. Peter, you can't walk on water. Peter knew that. But if Jesus said a word, he said, I can't walk on water, but I can walk on the word. And Jesus just said one word, come. And when Jesus said, come, like a plank shot out from that boat all the way to Jesus. He said, I can walk on that. I got a word from the Lord now. Amen. Those lepers said, amen, it hurts. We're, we're, we're diseased. We've been sitting against this wall so long that if we pull away, some of our body may stay attached to the wall. We may bleed. It may hurt. But if we stay this way, we're going to die. What they didn't know is that they begin to take steps in the word of God. And as they walked in that word, 
the Lord caused a great noise to come into the camp of the enemy and they fled and everything changed. Can I ask you tonight, how many would like to walk across the threshold of the front door of your house when you get home and walk into the presence of God, heaven on earth, and a new atmosphere in your house? Raise your hand. How are we going to do that, Brother Robert? Believe the word of the Lord. This word is not just for us to suffer until he comes. We may suffer persecution and the world may get darker out there. But we who believe his word, we shall have life and we shall have it more abundantly. We shall have it to the full. Sin may abound, but his grace shall abound even more. There may come a great falling away somewhere, but that's not my verse. My verse is as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. My verse is in the last days I pour out of my spirit and your your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Why you got to call out Joey like that? Because he's a son and I believe he's going to prophesy. Why you got to call out Joshua like that? Because he's a son and I believe he shall prophesy. Why you got to call out people and make them feel uncomfortable like Sarah? How oh, come on? Why, why would you call out people like Joy? Why would you call out these young people? Because I believe his word. You make them too uncomfortable, they may not come back. If they don't come back, they'll remember there was a preacher that didn't just patty cake them for showing up to church, but said the will of God. If you walk in it, you shall prophesy. You'll know the glory of God and the power of God. Come on, look at me real serious right now. Everything can change. Not because you scream hallelujah till you lose your voice. Not because you rebuke the devil all day and all night. But because you say, God, you've given me a command. I'm going to walk in it. And if I walk in obedience, I believe the devil's going to get a migraine because I'm crushing the head of the serpent. I believe there's going to come a shaking to the kingdom of darkness. I believe doors are going to open and strongholds are going to come down. And I'm going to live in the epicenter of a move of God. Stand with me to your feet all over the house. Oh, God, Lord, Lord, I am inadequate to communicate. Lord, I have not lived through the Welsh revival. I have not lived through the Azusa Street revival. I have not experienced, God, some of the greatest moves of God. I did not live in the book of Acts, but I do know this. You did not order our steps to go through dead church until you come again. Lord, you have designed and you have sent forth your word then in the last days you would pour out of your spirit God we want to walk in it we want to walk in it we want to walk in it come on you're here tonight and you say I don't just want to get the ripple effects of a move of God I want to walk in personal revival I want to be a one man one woman walking move of God I want the Holy Ghost to show up when I'm in the post office I want the Holy Ghost to show up when I'm at Canadian Tire I want the Holy Ghost to show up in Tim Hortons in my cubicle I want the Holy Ghost to show up in my job in my classroom hallelujah I don't know whose name is on this but the Lord has ordered your steps and you can carry the kingdom of God and crush the head of the serpent. Most of you are not struggling with 20 things. Most of you have been struggling with the same thing for 20 years. And the Lord is calling you to more. Sister Sue from Brantford, her and Daniel come and sit on the front row when they visit revival. And she worships and she jumps and she dances. And people think, man, she's, she's going too far. She said, this is not my nature. She said, for years, I sat in the back and I was timid and I was bashful. And the Lord, he convicted me and he broke me loose and said, I have not saved you to worship me like that. She said, this is not my natural personality, but the Lord has done something to me. Friend, I'm not saying you got to walk out of drugs. You may not all be bound by drugs. If you are, you can walk out tonight. But some of you need to walk out of religion. Listen, some of you need to walk out of the hurt from the past. Some of you need to walk out of the same old, same old. Read two verses, pray it now and lay me go to sleep. There's no revival in that. Some of you need to step into faith and say, God, I believe again. Revival is for me, my marriage, my children, my house. If you're ready to walk in it, I want you to step out of where you are. I want you to come and stand in this altar. Come on, don't just walk. March. March out of those pews. March into this altar. Somebody put your foot down with authority. Lord, I'm ready to stand in your will. Oh, God, I want to live
live in the epicenter. I want my living room to be the epicenter, God, of your glory in my cul-de-sac. Hallelujah. Lord, I want your glory. I want to carry your glory. I want to live in your glory. Hallelujah. Come on, this is a revival church. This is a revival church. This is God calling. He, we're not asking him to do something he doesn't want to do. We're responding to the seed he put in our heart. He said, when you said, seek my face, my heart said, your face I will seek. How many know it's the Lord that has already bid us to come and seek revival? It is the Lord who has started the pursuing and has tugged on your heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Close your eyes all over this altar. You're here tonight, and there's something standing between you and perfect obedience. If it's sin, you're about to confess it. If it's unforgiveness, you're about to be delivered of it. If it's bondage, you're about to go free. But you make up your mind right now. You're about to give God your eternal yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Come on, lift your hands all over this altar. Begin to tell him, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. My soul says yes. My soul says yes. Hallelujah. I'm going to worship in spirit and in truth. I'm going to walk in obedience. My feet are going to say yes. My feet are going to say yes. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Come on, I want to be in the epicenter. I want to be in the epicenter of obedience. Oh! When I obey him, I have authority to cast out devils. When I obey him, I have authority to pull down strongholds. When I obey him, I have authority to rebuke cancer. When I Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Come on, give him your yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I say yes. I say yes. I say yes. I want more than a job. I want more than a career. I want more than a paycheck. I want to be a carrier of your glory to live in the epicenter of your will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. We're just getting started tonight. Open up your heart to the Lord. We say yes. We say yes. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a gospel song that played on the radio in the South. And if you listen to black gospel, you know at the end of their song, sometimes the choir repeats the same line for like five minutes. And this black choir on this radio station, they were singing, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I'm talking about over and over and over and over. And when they were all done, the choir director says on the mic, he says, God, now you have our answer. So ask your question. We say yes. Come on, close your eyes and tell the Lord, Lord, I want to obey you, whatever you ask of me. That man of God, Dalton, said somebody was getting called tonight. Hallelujah. Are you ready to obey the call of God? Are you ready to be a missionary on your job? Are you ready to be a missionary to your neighbors on the left and on the right and across the street? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? God, I say yes. I say yes. I don't want to just exist. I want to live in the epicenter of your glory. I'll be a leper. I'll be a leper. But let me walk into the camp of the enemy and see the spoils of revival. Yes, oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, say yes, Lord.
church at the largest church in East Africa, in Mombasa, Kenya. 40,000 people attend that church. They have a 4 a.m. prayer meeting because they say if the Muslims get up at 5, our Jesus is worthy of greater sacrifice. They get up at 4. They have an all-night prayer meeting for their teenagers every Friday night. Lord, I don't just want the benefit of the ripple effects of a prayer meeting in Kenya. Lord, I don't want the benefit of a missionary movement from South Korea. Lord, won't you do it here? Won't you make Logos in Mississauga, Ontario, the epicenter of a move of God? Come on, lift your hands and ask him. We want to see the book of Acts in our day. We want to see the glory of Christ revealed in our homes, in our families. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Let my worship match my footsteps. Let my footsteps match my worship. Oh, we worship you. your neighbor by the hand hallelujah I see missionaries tonight I see God calling you to be missionaries to Ontario the most international region of the world is right here in your backyard are you ready to go are you ready to crush the head of the enemy? Come on, Jesus already crushed it. He's just enlisting you. He said, you can give him a migraine. You can give him a migraine too. You can, you can shred on serpents. How, listen, I've, I've used a lot of church talk, but how many understand there's a very real enemy that's trying to slither through our community, through our families, through the minds and thoughts and loved ones and hearts. And he says, I've given you authority. given you authority to tread down the serpents the reason I want you to take your neighbor by the hand is because the person's on your left and your right they may be bound right now and they need somebody to help crush the head of the enemy in their life so would you be bold enough to intercede for the person on your left and your right Lord we put the enemy to flight in their marriage Lord we crush the head of the enemy in their mind we don't know who's struggling with suicidal thoughts. We don't know who's struggling with, with, with infidelity. We don't know who's struggling with adultery. We don't know who's struggling with pornography. We don't know who's struggling with addiction. But Lord, in Jesus' name, we tread down the power of hell. We put the enemy under our feet in the name of Jesus. Oh, come on. Intercede. Pull him. Pull him. We're getting out of here. We're going on with Jesus. Get out of the darkness. Come out of your struggle. Be loosed. Be delivered. You're an overcomer in Jesus' name. You're an overcomer in Jesus' name. Put your foot on it tonight. Put 
your foot on it tonight. Put your foot on it tonight. Lord, I claim it. I claim it. Oh, I claim it in Jesus' name. We say yes, Jesus. We say yes. Hallelujah. We say
come on, look at me. I apologize if my preaching style is not your style, but would you by faith open the possibility that the Lord still would want to say to you something right now? He could have left you tied up and said, I'll walk into Jerusalem on my own two feet. But he said, loose him. I have need of them. Not a Bugatti, not a Maserati, a donkey, untamed, wild, upon whom no one had ever sat. Not a steed, not a thoroughbred, not a racehorse. He said, I choose you. I choose you. And when he mounted up on that animal, <laughs> everywhere Jesus went in his earthly ministry, he had two feet that carried the authority of the kingdom. But when he got on that beast, it was multiplied to four hooves. And they put palm branches under his feet and garments and cried out, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know what you're going to be tomorrow? You're going to be an untamed, non-thoroughbred, no special pedigree. Nobody knows your name. Nobody's booked you to preach a conference. You're not hopping on a plane to a mission field. You're just carrying Jesus into your city. And on the day of Pentecost, he multiplied his footsteps from two to 120. 240 Holy Ghost filled footsteps carrying Jesus into that community. I want you to get this in your spirit. Two things. There's a footprint of Jesus on the bottom of your coffin, on the back of your gravestone, where he rose from the dead to kick it down. And he says, now you can walk in resurrection power. You can walk in resurrection authority. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And number two, this is the cry of my heart, church. I hope it gets, I believe it's already in your spirit. I wouldn't be invited to be here. It's the DNA of this house. I refuse to live in the ripple effects of somebody else's revival. God, don't let us go another day without being in the epicenter. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I am the epicenter of a move of God. Come on, tell your neighbor, I am, touch him, I am the, come on, look at him serious, with the eyes of a prophet. My God, I am the epicenter of revival. When I obey God, I'm a carrier of his glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to turn it over to pastor or whoever's going to obey God. Amen. They might sing a song before pastor comes if they want to get that ready. But right before they do, you just want to give the devil a headache one more time. You just want to put your foot down one more time. Oh, I put my foot down. Devil, you will not have authority. I'm walking in the will of God. I'm walking in the authority of the kingdom. I'm walking. Ah, he said everywhere I put the sole of my foot, it shall be my inheritance. I claim revival is my inheritance. I claim revival is my inheritance. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go ahead, Brother Josh. Come on. If you want to, take one of these home with you. Write your name on it. Hallelujah. God bless you.
say a word here. Um, nobody asked to give me permission to do this, but if your leader is going to lead you into the rivers of God, it's going to cost him more than he knows. I love this man. I've loved him for a lot of years. Would you stretch forth your hand towards him and pray that no matter what the cost, God will keep him strong. God will keep him motivated. Even when other people come against him, that will surprise him. That he will walk on the mountains and he will take this church to where God wants it to be. Just stretch forth your hand. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Just begin, just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Oh, the Son of the Lamb. Oh, God. Nay, shut it out. Shut out the language of the Holy Ghost. Storm heaven. Hallelujah. Timo Shokobo Saika Baba Lalanate Tira Mamata Ye Kut Shokababa Baba 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 Say a tokubo boho chera. Timovo sa baba baba doho shaka baba baba baba. Timo say, Timo shorena sa baba baba hotata. 
We need to do some foot stomping here. We need to do some foot stomping here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Did the Lord help anybody tonight? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. These are, these are, these are you know, words that people don't like to hear. It's not, um, it's not decorum to use speech like this, but this church is having the contractions of birth. A contraction is not the same thing as birth. Don't be satisfied with a contraction. Don't be satisfied with the discomfort of stretching and labor pains. Know that if we press, if we push, if we prevail, if we travail, we shall see the desire of our heart that the Lord has put within us. I see you in the spirit going into your own arenas of your struggle, the place of your conflict, the place of your temptation, the place of your work, the place the enemy beats you down, your own home, your own marriage, your own living room, wherever it is, the place where suicidal thoughts come, the place where depression and anxiety come, I see you standing there after this service and standing and just standing and saying, Lord, I'm in the center of your will. I have put my foot on the head of the serpent and I will see the epicenter of the glory of God here. Not just at church, in your home. In your home. I remember I was in Bible college. I was in my dorm room. I was praying. The Lord said, take off your shoes. Take off your socks. I thought this is a strange thing I'm doing by myself. And my $17 Lazy Boy recliner I got from a thrift store. I sit down. I take off my shoes and my socks. He said, anoint the bottom of your feet. I said, this is weird. I'm by myself. I don't know. i never seen anybody do this. This feels weird. I start putting oil on the bottom of my bare feet. I said, God, what am I doing? He said, I'm anointing you for places you shall walk and tread and carry my gospel that you do not know. If the Lord leads you, just go home and put some oil on your feet. I don't slip on the linoleum afterwards, but be careful. But, but may it be a reminder and a token to you. You walk in the anointing. You know what he says in the Sermon on the Mount? When you give, when you fast, when you pray, it makes sense that he says when you give the Father who sees in secret rewards openly. It makes sense that he says when you fast the Father who sees in secret. But when you pray, don't you think he should say the Father who hears? But he doesn't. He says the Father who sees. Because sometimes when you're praying, you don't know what to say. But just stay standing in the will of God and say, Father, I don't know what to say right now. But you said... Lord, you see me when I'm standing in prayer. So God, you see me standing here. I put my foot down in your kingdom. I submitted to your will. I don't know what else to say, but you see me. And the Father who sees you standing in obedience, when you don't know the next step to take, shall reward you openly. Lord, let, let revival be the inheritance of our obedience. We cannot earn it. We cannot deserve it. By your grace and by your mercy, we ask you for nothing less than revival. We ask not for a decrease of birth pains. We ask you for an increase until we see the desire of our hearts that you have given us come to fruition. Hallelujah. And revival's birth in every home. Hallelujah. 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 Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Pastor said to leave him there because he's, he's just held captive by the Spirit of God right now. He said, I, I could dismiss. He's just going to stay there. He said he can't move. Now the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you and give you peace. As you walk in obedience and walk in the epicenter of revival in Jesus name amen amen you can pray you can be dismissed the Lord bless you we'll see you tomorrow night at six for prayer and seven for service bring somebody with you
you. God bless you.